All right, welcome back. We want to, in this lesson, cover using the Minkowski diagrams and the matrices, right? These Lorentz transformation matrices we learned about, and study some of the basic properties of special relativity just to see how those properties emerge from using these tools. And the properties I want to discuss today are length contraction, very famous property, time dilation, which is perhaps even more famous. Um, the reason time dilation would be more famous than length contraction is we actually measure this routinely in the lab. Length contraction is, you know, involving measuring rods moving near the speed of light. It's kind of hard to get your handle around how an experiment would measure it, but it can. I mean, the, the implications of length contraction are clearly something we can discuss. Uh, it is relevant to our uh, notion of transformation of magnetic and electric fields. So uh, this is an observable effect. But this one is really observable because we can measure time very well. And uh, it's just experimentally seems to be something more attackable. But then I also, once we nail those two things down, I want to talk about the barn pole paradox. We want to use this uh, Minkowski diagram to resolve the barn and pole paradox. And I want to at least set up a lesser known but very important paradox, the rod ring paradox. This one you probably have never heard of. Um, unless you've really studied special relativity quite a bit. But this one is really important because it sets us up to understand Thomas precession. In other words, the resolution of this paradox involves uh, observing a rotation uh, that is a non-intuitive rotation. And when I say non-intuitive rotation, I mean after you've developed the intuition of special relativity, then a non-intuitive thing pops up, right? So it's kind of fun. All right, so let's begin with length contraction. So to start this discussion, we have to understand that when we're talking about length contraction, we need to be dealing with an extended physical object. The, uh, for, for, for purposes of illustration, we need to demonstrate and we need to use an extended physical object. Length contraction is much more fundamental than that. Literally, space is being contracted, but we're going to demonstrate it with an extended physical object. And somehow that helps us understand that space itself Un, uh, has this property of contracting, uh, moving, moving rods look short, right? But when I say look, that implies there's some kind of illusion. Moving rods are short, and that's part of the barn pole paradox is to show that moving rods are in fact short. So, um, uh, so by showing that a moving physical object is shortened, that somehow really should be, the point of that is to emphasize that space itself is being shortened. Because goodness knows if you shorten a physical object, then, you know, how could you do that uniformly unless something's going on with space itself? So that's the idea. So we're going to work with an extended physical object. But this, of course, begs the question, well, demands the question, how do we represent an extended physical object on a space-time diagram? What do we mean by this? Because What's the alternative, by the way, right? We deal with objects in special relativity all the time. And the alternative, of course, is a particle, right? A particle, it's still a physical object, but it's not extended, right? And so a particle really uh, is easy to put on a space-time diagram because a particle op occupies a place on the space-time diagram. You know, the particle has coordinates in the lab frame, and it has coordinates in the um, uh, the moving frame, right? These two are the coordinates in the moving frame, and these two values are the coordinates in the lab frame. So it's easy to locate a particle. But, you know, so now say the particle is some kind of object. Well, you know, can I just put it arbitrarily on the diagram? And if I do, what, what does that exactly mean? And this is this is tricky, right? Because if you just take seriously what I just drew, right, you would say, well, the left end of this is very well fixed. It's got good coordinates, unambiguous coordinates in both frames of reference. You know, the right hand side also has unambiguous coordinates in both frames of reference, right? I could draw these lines on the right hand side and I can tell you the exact point, uh, the exact space time point for that in both systems. Right, uh, the way I've drawn it, it's kind of parallel to the time axis there, but um, you know I can still find the coordinates of any two points. I can take any two points, right, 
and I can attach them with a line and say there's a material point at every spot here and there's an extended physical object. So, you know, that, that is doable and it is allowable, but it's really not what we're after. Because when we think of an extended physical object that we're observing, we want to we, we, we want to mean something a little bit more strict. So if I put one end of our rod, our extended physical rod, at the origin, t equals zero and x equals zero, when I talk about the object as a thing that's undergoing physics, I'm talking about the object as it exists in one full slice of time. That is, an extended physical object, as I want to describe it now, has to lie at one time. Every point on this object has to exist at different points in space because it is, after all, extended, right? But it has to exist at the same time. We're talking about the object as it exists at one moment of simultaneity, right? So this, ex this counts as a good space-time indication of an extended physical object because every point on the physical object is, exists at a simultaneous moment. Now, this is arranged, this is, or, this is a space-like interval, right? This point is not in any kind of communication with this point because this is beyond a 45-degree line in this diagram. And you remember, you know, that's the speed of light, right? So nothing from this point can communicate with that point. And that brings us into a whole different and fascinating subject that I don't know much about, but it's called, um, I think it's loosely called, uh, the relativistic theory of elasticity, right? Where we're talking about, you know, the speed of sound in this object is finite. And so the speed of sound can only propagate like, well, it can only propagate kind of like this, you know, something above 45 degrees. So a signal from here can only get to here in a certain amount of time, right? But the whole object itself, right? The whole object itself, whoops, can move through space-time along some world line as long as it's, as long as that world line is uh, not going beyond 45 degrees, right? This object can just move, well, presumably up. You can't go backwards in time, right? But you can move up along world line, or if you're following, if you're attached to the S prime frame, you move like this, right? The left-hand side is always staying at x equals zero in the moving frame, and it's advancing in time, right? That's a perfectly allowable movement. But the, uh, the whole thing moves together as a, a slice of time in the frame of the, uh, the lab. Remember, this is this we're calling the lab frame. X is the lab frame. So, um, so that's what we mean by an extended physical object, is it has to exist at a slice in time. So how would that work for the moving frame? Well, clearly, an extended physical object in the if i lay out an extended physical object in the stationary frame then there's an issue because in the moving frame an extended physical object has got to be oops i don't want to change the size too much has got to be uh let's see i've got to orient it so it's in a in a constant time slice of the moving frame so that's what an extended physical object would look like in the moving frame because all the points are at the same time, right? They exist all at the same time. So if I was to, if it was to demonstrate movement, oh, let me get rid of, let me get rid of that. So if we were to demonstrate movement in the, uh, the, the moving frame, or, or if we were to demonstrate how it appears in the moving frame, right? It's, it's stationary in the moving frame. So this motion here is stationary in the moving frame. But notice at every instant in time, it is a, uh, it exists as a, all, every point on this object exists at the same time. So clearly the issue is that an extended, an object that is an extended physical object on our diagram in this frame doesn't really count as an extended physical object in the other frame. And that's because clearly this guy has a different, uh, there's two different times, right? There's this, the, the, the right end of the rod and the left end of the rod are at two different times. And so it's, it's kind of like you're looking at a rod at one moment and then you're considering the left end of the, if in the stationary frame you're, or the lab frame, you're considering the left end of the rod at one time and the right end of the rod at some other time. 
and that uh, uh, just doesn't make sense for a physical object. So our issue now is converting this extended physical object to the extended physical object you would observe on the ground, right? And this one here we call the proper one, right? Because any object that is an extended physical object in its own rest frame, that's the proper length of the object, right? So I'm going to call this, I'm going to call this uh, uh, L0 perhaps, right? Because this is in the frame where this object is at rest. And that's usually what we call the proper length of things when we're talking about pure length. So the length of this in the rest frame is, uh, is L0. Now, the, uh, the question is, is, well, when I find the equivalent physical object in this frame, right, it's going to be some other extension. Now, it's kind of obvious what's going to happen, right? This is going to be projected back, and that's going to be, and this length is going to be the length of the object. And the, the factor is going to be 1 over gamma, right? So the, the, the extended physical object's length in the lab frame is going to end up being 1 over gamma L0. But we want to demonstrate that using our, uh, our matrix mathematics, right? And this isn't just a simple Lorentz transformation, right? This point, when you do a Lorentz, and this is an important thing I notice people struggle with a bit. If I do a Lorentz transformation of every point on this rod, all I'm doing is taking the coordinates of, say, this point here, right? The coordinates of that point are 0, L0, 0, and 0 in the frame of the moving rod, right, in the rest frame of the rod. When I do a lens tra transformation, all I'm doing is finding this coordinate here and this coordinate here, and I'm just converting it into uh, some time coordinate, some space coordinate, and presumably the other two will remain zero. But that's all the Lorentz transformation does. It just changes the coordinates. It doesn't literally transform. You can't use the Lorentz tra transformation to somehow turn this rod from the moving frame into the rod of the, uh, of, the, of the lab frame. You have to think a little bit more a little bit differently, right? So, so we're, we're actually going to kind of work backwards, right? We're going to ask the following question. Given an oh, extended physical object in the lab frame, how do we understand it? Uh, how do we understand the length of this object compared to its differential length in the moving frame, which I've actually sort of attached these parallel lines in order to establish the coordinates of this point in the moving frame, which, as you can see clearly here, shows that this is not a Station, a, not a, um, a, a true example of an extended physical object in the moving frame, but it does have a spatial extent. I mean, this object here does have a spatial extent given by this coordinate, and it does have a time extent given by this coordinate. So we're going to look for the relationship between these things. And to do this, we are going to use our Lorentz transformation matrix, right? And we're this is just as before. We, we kind of cut it down to just this box here. I guess I should mark that. So here we have uh, the, the gamma matrix cut down. Everything's zero except one, one, gamma, gamma. And this is going from uh, the S prime frame to the S frame. So from the moving frame to the stationary frame. And now this is a linear operator, right? This can take a, a, a four vector and gives you another four vector. So we can actually take the two points here, the left point and the right point of this object, and or any object, right? This is this actually is what I'm about to write is true for any any uh, uh, two points. And so what we're going to do is we're going to write this down in in the coordinates of the prime frame. We're going to say, well, there's some the left side of this thing has some time coordinate, and the left side of this thing has some space coordinate, right? But, you know, the right side of the thing has a time coordinate, and the right side of the thing has a space coordinate too, in the moving frame, right? And because this is uh, a linear process, if I take the difference between these two, that is fine. The, the matrix times this, the, the, the left side, um, uh, coordinate point 
minus the matrix times the right side coordinate point is the matrix times the difference between the two coordinate points, right? So I'm going to write this down now as, as this left side minus the right side, I'm going to write this down as just delta t prime and delta x prime, right? The change in the, uh, the t prime axis and the x prime, uh, the t prime coordinates and the x prime coordinates of the points of the object. And then uh, I'm just going to do the math, right? Uh, obviously, I've kind of cleaned this up. It was a little too messy for my taste, right? So I cleaned it up. You just have to track that we're only using this piece of the matrix and these diagonal ones. And then um, I write down the expressions, right? Delta T is the result of this matrix operation on this vector. And that gives you this expression right here, gamma delta T prime minus gamma beta x delta x prime equals delta t, where this is the time interval uh, that is experienced by the left and right sides of the bar in the stationary frame or in the lab frame. And then, uh, then if I execute the same matrix operation on the second element of the vector and, and discover the second element of the vector, I get this expression, which uh, is basically just this line here times these two things right here. And uh, now the point is, now we talk about the extended physical object. I'm only interested in the circumstance where, where delta t is actually equal to zero, right? I want the resulting bar to have no, space, no temporal extent between the left and right sides. I want them to both be at the same slice of time. So if I turn that, I, I basically set this term to zero, and then I set that equal to that, and then I get an expression for delta t prime in terms of delta x prime, right? And it's forced by my notion of what an extended physical object is. This is where I insert that, uh, that notion. So I calculate delta t prime, it's just beta x of delta x prime, and then I use this and insert it in here, and now I get an expression for delta x in the, um, in the lab frame with respect to delta x in the moving frame. And then you just crunch the algebra a little bit, and you get delta x prime gamma 1 minus beta x squared. But if you remember that gamma is 1 over the square root of 1 minus beta x squared, so you now have delta x prime is 1 minus beta of x squared over the square root of 1 minus beta of x squared, and you end up with delta x prime, or the spatial extent in the moving frame, divided by gamma is the spatial extent in the stationary frame. Gamma is a number that's greater than 1, so this spatial extent is less than that spatial extent, and that is the notion of length contraction. And the way this sort of plays out is that uh, uh, it's sort of in the obvious way. I'll just draw it again. In fact, if we reverse this process a little bit, what we'll do is we'll lay the bar out as though it's a extended physical object in the moving frame, and we'll say that it has one unit in length. Well, the question is, we, we take each point on the physical object and we just, we just shift it back to find what is the equivalent point where everything is uh, in the same time slice of the... Of the uh, of the lab frame. And that's not really hard. You just basically you're following a line parallel to the timeline and you find this point right here and this becomes the physical object in the uh, in, in the lab frame. And we already know we already know that this point here, if you just find its coordinate in the lab frame by just dropping a parallel to the time, you know that this will land this will land at exactly gamma, right? So this this length here is um, one divided by gamma, right? So that this point here is at one divided by gamma. And that logic is reflected in this mathematics that we just did over here. So here we used our Lorentz transformation 
to uh, get at it. But we had to add this notion that we're interested only in things that have no temporal extent, only in physical objects where every point on the object on the space-time diagram has the same time in the lab frame. And so a rod that's moving along with one full unit in the um, moving frame, uh, it only has a length of, it only once we understand it to be a physical object in the stationary frame, its length is actually one over gamma. So if we're very close to the speed of light, say, you know, gamma could be two or three or four, it can be shrunk to a third of its length, a half of its length. It can be shrunk arbitrarily small. Now notice that if we're dealing with a particle, it becomes kind of a non-thing because, you know, it has no extent in either frame, right? Anyway, so that is uh, how length contraction is understood in, uh, in these Lorentz... It, well, it's understood this is how the calculation is executed. This is what you usually do in special relativity courses, but you usually, but, but without the matrix. The matrix is a little heavy-handed tool for this, but I want us to get used to it, using it. But you can also just sort of see the utility of this Minkowski diagram. And you can also see how hard the Minkowski diagram would be to work if you were going really fast, you know, close to the speed of light, right? And you tried to slip your physical object like this, and then draw parallel lines back, and it'd be really, really tiny, and everything would be like blown up into the corner. So these these Minkowski diagrams are are just for they're very uh, pedagogical in a sense, but you've got to kind of leave these angles. I don't know what speed this angle actually would turn out to be, right? This would be something like well, maybe we should think about it a little bit. Hold on. Okay, so roughly to my eye, uh, this slope literally turns out to be beta x of 0 0.444, and that corresponds to a gamma of 1 point, uh, um, 1.12, something like that. Yeah, that's not too bad. I mean, I think my geometric construction is not so far off. Okay, so that's length contraction. Now, the next one we're going to talk about is uh, time dilation. But time dil it's, the, it's really going to be the same process. But in here, instead of having an extended physical object that all exists at the same, same time slice, we're going to demand our clocks stay in the same positions, right? And then, you know, I, I'm not even going to work the math, but uh, we will do the illustration. So let's do length contraction. Oops, I mean time dilation, time dilation. So here we start now with two clocks which I've uh, called the blue clock and the green clock. The blue clock is going to, well, they're both going to start at the same place, but they're in two different frames of reference, right? The green clock is in the moving frame of reference. It's attached to the moving frame, and the blue clock is uh, in the lab. The point is, is that the blue clock in the lab will be moving, non-moving, I guess. It's moving relative to the... Uh, moving frame, of course, but it's stationary in the non-moving frame or in the lab frame. So it just follows a world line right up the time axis, right? Just rolls right up the time axis. I keep moving it backwards. Of course, obviously, it doesn't move backwards in time, but it moves up. And as it moves, it ticks. Now, let's talk a little bit about clocks, right? What is a clock? Well, a clock is ultimately a clock is some kind of oscillator and some kind of counter. It oscillates, and it's got to, to be a good clock. The oscillations have to have uniform periodicity. And to be a meaningful clock, it has to be able to count the number of oscillations that have happened. So an oscillator and a counter. The very most famous one is a nice cesium clock, you know, the, the typical standard from NIST that is uh, keeping track of everything using physical properties of cesium. We don't need to talk about the nature of a clock, but we do need to understand that when we're talking about this, these two clocks are constructed the same way. They're built the same way, just like the two measuring rods, a measuring rod moving off with the moving frame and a measuring rod that's left behind. They're the same darn rod, right? Two different copies of the same rod. So how do we know this? Well, we start, everybody starts in the same frame of reference. They both take a clock that's identical. They both take a moving rod that's identical and off they go. The point is, is that it's very important to understand that the nature of the clock doesn't matter because it's not the clock that's being affected. It's not the rod that's being affected. The clocks are running slow, not because the clock mechanism is running slow. It's running slow because time is running slow. So you, you, your heartbeats are slow, your 
your, well, I was going to say your pulse rate, but it's kind of the same thing. Your heart rate is slow. The clock is slow. Um, everything you see around you is slow. So you don't notice anything. In, in your proper frame, everything is fine. If a clock, if time is slowing down, right? If time is slowing down, there's no way to know. But you can look at somebody else's clock, right? The guy at the ground can look at the moving clock and then compare notes, right? And we can compare, I can compare the marking on my clock with the marking on your clock. And I can determine whether your clock is running slower than mine or faster, like possibly, I suppose. And, uh, and then I can make determinations about how time is flowing in your system. And that's what's going on here. So what's happening is the way we model this time dilation problem is we start in the same position and this clock moves up to some spot and we'll call that spot, I don't know, we'll call it one, right? So the after one, we'll call it one meter of time, right? It's like, it should be a second, right? But it's a meter of time. And because every time is at the same units as everything else in this problem. And while it's doing that, this other clock is moving in tandem with the moving frame of reference, right? So there comes a point where the lab clock actually ticks one oscillation or one oscillation count, or I shouldn't say one oscillation. It comes to some, I mean, because it's oscillating very fast, right? But uh, so it comes for, it, it, it determines that it's gone at one meter of time. And the parallel time slice, I'm interested in what is the marking on this clock over here at this same instant in time. As soon as I click one, I want to know what is happening with this clock at that moment. And, you know, you can tell right away that th we, we already know that um, there's a point out here one unit of time out, who when I drop down, I get gamma units of time in the lab frame, right? So I know already that this clock has not reached one at my simultaneous plane of movement. Now you could ask the question, well, how do you know, right? If you're space-like separated, how do you get a signal from this clock to tell you what time it is? And very sophisticated treatments of this actually deal with that question, right? Because this clock will start sending light signals back, reporting its time, and then you can calculate, you can figure out what was this clock reading when this clock was reading one. It's not a hard problem. But what we're interested in is what is the simultaneous time slice here? What is this clock reading? And it's obviously reading less than one. So in the sl time slices of the lab, of the lab, you know that the moving clock is running slowly. And that we say moving clock is running slowly, but of course everybody needs to understand time itself is flowing slowly in the uh, moving frame. And you can literally reverse this process, right? You can absolutely reverse this process uh, the following way, right? You now take this clock, uh, you take, uh, whoops, you take our you take our two clocks, you bring them back to the beginning, and now you're going to be interested in, you, you're now moving along with the moving clock, right? So it's the same argument, right? The moving clock runs along, and while it runs along, the, uh, uh, the lab clock is running along. But the lab clock is, we're interested in its uh, parallel time-like slice, right? It's instantaneous slice. They're both stationary, right? They're both at the same position. They're not moving their position. This is always at x prime equals zero in the moving frame. And in the lab frame, this clock is always at x equals zero. But now uh, we are looking at, we're interested in simultaneous time slices in the, in the, uh, uh, the moving frame. And those simultaneous time slices are all parallel lines to the x prime axis, right? So we're interested in these parallel lines. So now this clock is here, right? This clock is now on this, this plane of simultaneity relative to the, the, uh, the moving frame. And clearly, He's lagging, right? Because, well, I guess I shouldn't say that. What I'll say is that you take this clock and you finally move it up to one tick, right? 
Well, when you move that clock up to one tick, this other clock is now down here. And, uh, oh, I guess I removed the tick before. So the one tick is right about here. I, I, I think when I selected it, I selected the tick too. But you can clearly see that this clock has not yet reached one. So in the, in the frame of the, um, in the moving frame, we're calling it, if you are in the moving frame and you look at the simultaneous ticks of the clock that's left behind, you notice that it runs slow. So both sides see the other clock as running slow. It's fine. I didn't do that for the length contraction, but you can show that the, the length contraction of, uh, uh, of a moving rod, right? Uh, they both perceive the rod as, as, uh, as being shorter, right? So they both see contraction. And the issue is, is that why it seems like this is the, the typical problem with this, with this issue of time dilation is, well, everybody sees everybody else's clocks running slow. And this is the origin of the twin paradox, right? If everybody sees everybody else's clocks running slow, whose clock is actually running slower when you bring two twins together? You, you create that physical situation of undeniable contradiction. And we're not going to go into the twin paradox, but it is definitely something you should be. Every physicist should be able to explain the twin prods. You're not really a physicist if you can't explain these base. These are pretty basic things, actually, time dilation. But what, what we're doing a little differently is we're kind of focusing on this matrix method. And, and these Minkowski diagrams are not totally typically taught and used all the time. But anyway, um, uh, so this is the nature of time dilation. All, everybody who's looking at a clock that they perceive as moving, they also perceive that that clock is ticking more slowly. And the factor will exactly be gamma. If you look at this you know, if we look at this uh, analysis, right, we remember from our previous analysis that this point is, in fact, 1 over gamma, which is exactly the factor that uh, will slow the clock down. Okay, so that's time dilation. Notice the importance of simultaneity again, right? Simultaneity is important in time dilation. It was important in understanding our physical objects. Um, so uh, simultaneity is what this is all about. So let's review the most famous paradox involving simultaneity uh, in special relativity, the barn and pole paradox. All right, so how does this barn and pole paradox work? It's pretty simple. In fact, it's one of the easiest ones to explain. We imagine ourselves with a barn, and we are standing in the reference frame of the barn, so we're basically on the ground, and the barn has some proper length B0, meaning we're in the rest frame of the barn, we measure the length of the barn, and uh, the length is B0. And there's a rod that is flying towards the barn, and it's flying very quickly, and it has a contraction of gamma. So the bar this rod is L0, the proper length of the rod, divided by gamma long. So this rod is length contracted, because there is some proper length out there where if we were in the reference frame of the rod, it would be length L0. Of course, if we were in the reference frame of the rod, the barn would be moving toward the rod, and the barn would look contracted by the same factor gamma. So these are two different circumstances, as one is viewed by the, in the stationary frame of the rod, or the proper frame of the rod, and the other is viewed in the proper frame of the barn. The problem is, or the paradox, is that the rod fits inside the barn, and you can close the doors of the barn and actually contain the rod inside the barn, right? And that the reason we do this for this paradox is we want to demonstrate that this isn't some illusion. This isn't some trick of the light or some strange uh, effect of visualizing the rod of length zero, and it just appears to be smaller. It's actually smaller. You can close the doors of this barn on both sides and that rod is length contracted and will fit inside the barn. Case closed, end of story. The paradox, of course, is that if you look at the same analysis where the barn is moving, the barn now moves over the rod, and at no point does the rod ever fit inside the barn. But you are closing the doors of the barn at some point, so what gives, right? And of course, what's going to give, just as a spoiler alert, is we close the doors of the barn at the same time in the reference frame of the barn. And we're not closing the doors of the barn at the same time in the reference frame of the rod.
And so let's now have a look at how this is resolved using our Minkowski diagram. So let's begin by setting up this Minkowski diagram. So first thing you'll notice is that I've chosen chosen a reference frame for the bar, meaning the move the moving frame is moving much faster, and you can tell because this angle is a lot smaller, right? So beta is a lot steeper, and the diagram's getting to the point where it's almost this is about as steep as you would want for one of these diagrams to work. Now the barn in the proper so S is the reference frame of the barn. And the proper frame of the barn, the front side of the barn, is given by this straight line. You know, it's never changing its position in the frame of the barn. And likewise, uh, the rear of the barn is also got its constant world line. So those are constant world lines in the uh, fresh frame of the barn. Obviously, the barn is moving in the frame of the, of the rod, the rest frame of the rod. Now, the proper length of the barn, we have to get that square. The proper length of the barn is this length right here, right? And the barn is an extended object, so we have to use a, a constant time slice, and that's the proper length of the barn. Now, in this picture, you see that the barn is length contracted. Well, what's the proper length? What, what is the length of the barn as perceived by the, uh, the rod, you know, in, in the rod's frame? How, where is that depicted on this diagram? Well, I need a line of constant time, which is any line parallel to this. Remember, this is the x prime axis and the t prime axis. So any line parallel to this x prime axis is a line of constant time. So this is the length. This is the length of the barn in, uh, in, in the reference frame of the this length here, right? That's the length of the barn in the reference frame of the rod. But the, now this is where our diagram kind of fails us a little bit because if you looked at it, you would think, well, this is smaller than this. But we remember how we ticked everything out. Remember, we, we ticked everything out where we found one unit in the, one unit in the uh, uh, frame of the moving frame was gamma units which is larger than one in the rest frame. So this distance here actually is larger by a factor of gamma to this distance here, which is exactly what this is showing us. The problem is, is the geometry is hyperbolic, right? So as these lines tilt up towards 45 degrees, these distances actually get smaller, right? And that isn't accounted for very well on this diagram, right? The distances just don't look, you know, all we, we, we see Euclidean distances in our head. We can't correct that to make it look shorter. So we actually have to bring some knowledge into this diagram and understand, right, that one unit in the moving frame is actually a full gamma num units uh, when projected onto, the, um, uh, onto the, the rest frame. And that's why this is actually a foreshortened barn. So this distance here in the moving frame actually does represent this shorter barn. Okay, so now, how do we understand this paradox? Well, let's begin by grabbing our rods. Now, I call them rods because <laughs> they're, there's a rod that's in the rest frame and a rod that's in the moving frame, but they're the same rod, right? So it's the same rod as understood from the rod's own rest frame and from the frame of the barn. And right away you can see that these rods are represented. This is the Lorentz contracted rod, and this is the proper rod, right? Because it's proper because it's in its own rest frame. The closest you're ever going to get to the notion of a preferred frame in special relativity is the proper frame of something. The problem is, is that physically that's not particularly preferred, but it is the reference frame of choice to simplify problems as much as you can. So this is so this here is is the rod in the the, the equal time slice rod, the extended object in the rest frame of the rod, and this is the extended equal time object in the rest frame of the uh, uh, barn. And you'll notice there's no way of representing that here is uh, in this kind of sketch. It really comes out uh, in this Minkowski diagram. So now, how does this thing move? Well, as time goes on, the left side of both rods just stays at a constant position in uh, 
the moving frame, but is moving to the right in the rest frame. So obviously we're moving this way in the rest frame from, from left to right, and we're actually stationary in the moving frame, and the barn is moving from right to left. Right? So what happens is eventually there comes a point in the rods frame where the rod sees the barn actually cover or, or, or cover the front end of the barn actually begins to cover the rod. And that happens right at this point, right? Right at this point. This is the, the front tip of the rod um, is now being uh, covered, is fully been approached by the barn and the barn is now covering the front tip of the rod. And then the rod uh, or the barn then proceeds and then the back end of the barn then covers the front tip of the rod. And then there's a point where the barn is right over the entirety of the rod. Well, I shouldn't say the entirety, but the, the, the rod actually is protruding from both ends of the barn as the barn passes over the rod. And then we get to a point where uh, the rear end of the rod is inside the barn and the front end is out, meaning the front end has left the, or the barn has crossed, the back of the barn has crossed the front end of the uh, rod. It's very tempting to keep saying that the rod is moving, but it's the barn that's moving over the rod, right? And then eventually the barn completely passes the rod. So that's what things look like in the rest frame of the rod. Now, in the rest frame of the barn the rod approaches the barn, right? And now the blue end just enters the barn right there. And then the blue end moves through the barn. And then the, uh, the, the left side of the, of, the, uh, of the rod enters the barn. And now the rod is fully inside the barn. And then the rod exits the barn. The barn is stationary and the rod moves through. And the idea is, is that right at this point here, this is where we close the doors. So we close the door there and we close the door there. Now we just close it for an instant, right? Because I don't want to get into the story of what happens when the rod hits the door. You know, what if the door is very solid and the rod couldn't bust the door? What would happen then? And that's where we get into the relativistic theory of elasticity. And it's a subject that I just don't want to get into, but it is fascinating. But it all has to do with the fact that the speed of sound in the rod is below the speed of light, and therefore the deceleration of the rod doesn't happen instantaneously. It happens as a matter of, of time. And then, of course, once you decelerate the rod, it becomes its, its switching reference frames now. So it becomes its natural length, but the pulse going through the rod is propagating relatively slowly compared to the motion of the rod, etc., etc., etc. But now we're doing, we're closing the doors, just we're flashing the doors shut just at this instant, just to prove that the rod is inside the barn. Well, of course, flashing them simultaneously is only simultaneous relative to the barn. So what is the flashing times uh, in the frame of the rod, right? What does the rod see? Well, the rod sees this time here is you have to draw a parallel line to the x-axis. And this is the time where the rod sees the back door shut. And what about the front door? Well, the front door, same thing. The rod sees the front door shut somewhere around. Actually, that's probably not right. It's probably a little more like, well, let me move the rod out of the way, right? Let me, let me, uh, um, let me first move this rod out of the way, right? And then let's draw these lines, right? So this, these parallel lines are absolutely terrible, right? So hold on. Okay, here's some better parallel lines. So this point, which is at this time here, right, uh, in the uh, Barnes frame, right, everything happens in the Barnes frame on this simultaneous slice of time, but it actually happens at this time, right, this time here, I'll call that T rear close, and at this time here, that is T um, front close, in the frame of the rod. So now let's go back to seeing how this looks to the rod as the rod's moving. So the rod, so, so now the barn is approaching the rod, the barn is approaching the rod, the barn is approaching the rod, the barn now crosses the rod, and then at this moment here, the rod sees the front or the rear of the barn flash. 
it flashes closed and then open. And then the rod proceeds, the rod proceeds, the rod proceeds, the rod now, the rear now enters, it now enters, or, or the barn front edge now crosses the rear of the rod. And of course, the rod, the bard's rear edge has already crossed the front of the rod, right? So the rod's protruding. And then now the rear flashes, right? So the rod is fully past that rear door when it flashes. And then the the barn moves across the rod. So you see the simultaneity in, in the rod's frame, the, those, those doors opened and shut in these weird ways. It was approaching the rear of the barn and then it sees a flash up ahead, but it clears it because the flash is over when the front end of when the uh, rear of the barn crosses the front of the rod. And likewise, after well after the rod has passed uh, anything of concern, uh, anything of concern regarding the um, the rear, it's already fully inside the barn, right? So everything looks good to the rod, and uh, it's all about a matter of simultaneity. And these two expressions of what happened are completely legitimate. They're physically totally legitimate. The fact that simultaneity is not a universal thing doesn't matter. There's every conceivable physical phenomenon can be interpreted from both frames of reference. And this rod did in fact fit inside the barn. That's a real effect, right? That That is a real thing. And lengths of things are just not relevant in physics. If they were, then there'd be a disaster, right? Because, you know, this is a, a huge circumstance that uh, uh, is totally, appears totally differently. So all of physics has to work around this problem. It has to work around the fact that the length of any object is immaterial to the physics, right? The only thing that is material to the physics is the space-time interval of objects. And that space-time interval... Um, or, or of events, between events, because that space-time interval is invariant and it can never change. So we have to construct all of our physics around things that are invariant. And the length of objects that are in relative motion, it's not invariant, so it can, you will never see a real physical law where the length of an object can possibly matter. Um, okay, so that's the barn pole paradox. Uh, let's see if I have time to set up the rod ring paradox. Well, no, I don't think I do. So it, we'll just start with the rod ring paradox in the next lesson. It's got a lot of meat to it, so we don't want to. Uh, we we want to do it full justice. So anyway, this is great. I, I I'm hoping that you've enjoyed learning how to use these Minkowski diagrams. Special relativity is really cool. Uh, sorry about begging off the theory of elast. I'm not an expert on the relativistic theory of elasticity, but there are many paradoxes. There's like this bug rivet paradox, which uh, is very fun but it has to do with the relativistic theory of elasticity as its resolution. And there's this notion, by the way, if you're interested in the subject, it's called born rigidity. Um, and we are always assuming that we're dealing with things that are born rigid, but there are circumstances where you can't assume that. I think they involve, uh, you know, when you start spinning things, when you take a, a wheel and you start spinning it relativistically, um, uh, it gets, uh, <laughs> things get really, really weird. And and you don't need to know all of that stuff for special relativity. The stuff for special relativity you need to know, this barn pole paradox is a definite thing that everybody who claims to understand special relativity must be able to walk through. I mean, that's just de rigueur. Same with the length contraction and time dilation. But for our purposes, the most important point or the important point is how to use and understand this matrix. Now, this matrix, notice it's a single boost in the beta direction, right? So now we have to talk about multiple boosts, right? And that's going to be the uh, uh, where we start heading with the rod ring paradox and uh, per, uh, Thomas precession. But this is a, this single boost. I I, I kind of work through this problem using this matrix. It's a little bit heavy handed, but uh, I want to make sure everybody's comfortable with these pure Lorentz boost symmetric Lorentz boost matrices. Okay, so ring rod uh, ring rod paradox next time.